start recording. Um, also, uh, another note, good news, uh, the test from yesterday worked. I got people's names and responses for the poll everywhere thing, so I will try to continue using some of that um, throughout the class. I think later today I'll have another one of those examples uh, where I'll see if I'll, I have something planned. We'll see if it works well. Um, okay, so starting off, there's kind of, uh, well, kind of even before that, uh, what is a material? So uh, when I say we're, we're going to be working with materials, what does that mean? Um, and from a really simple point, it's, it's anything made of atoms. So um, you have some atom, an element, uh, or yeah, some element that then uh, combines with other either similar or different elements to make larger structures, um, crystalline structures, polymeric structures, uh, and can combine in different crystal orientations, it can be amorphous, uh, and there's kind of a whole big range of, of ways that those elements can, can organize themselves that all give it different properties. Um, so the elements themselves have different properties, and the way that they organize then the properties, or changes the emergent properties. Um, and so uh, we can talk uh, this a little bit later about more complicated materials, composites, um, different combinations of materials and, and foams, um, but there's kind of three simple broad classes of, of, of basic materials, metals, ceramics, and polymers, which hopefully you're all relatively familiar with. So, um, so our metals, uh, to start off with, uh, these form crystalline structures. So you have a single type of metal ion uh, that'll form some sort of a crystal packing. Um, these crystal packings come as uh, FCC, which, um, so, uh, ah, I'll, I'll kind of go through them. So uh, this is our face centered cubic, uh, our BCC, which is body centered cubic, and our HCP, uh, which is hexagonal, hexagonal, close, packed. Uh, there's also a simple cubic, uh, which we mostly ignore because there's almost no metals that form simple cubic structures, uh, so we can kind of generally ignore those. Uh, so I'm going to switch over. Instead of drawing all of these things, uh, which I could <coughs> do, I'm going to switch over to this to remind you, you, you should hopefully be, oh, let's see if it goes. There it goes. Um, so you should hopefully be familiar with these structures. I, I was thinking about drawing them out uh, on a paper, but I'm also horrible at drawing. Um, so I opted to find a picture online, so as you had said. So uh, our, our BCC, body-centered cubic, uh, all of these, BCC and FCC form a, a cube. Uh, body-centered cubic has one single atom in the center, and then all of the atoms on the corners of the cube. Face-centered cubic, you have atoms on the corners, and then one in the center of each face. Uh, hexagonal close packs, you form these hexagons. Uh, inside, there's a, a smaller, again, a, a, a hexagon that's slightly shifted uh, by half a unit over uh, and an atom down. Um, later on, so, so the way that these actually deform uh, these structures uh, is interesting and important, but uh, kind of beyond what I want to talk about right now. This is just kind of a reminder of what their structures are. Going back. Um, so just to kind of put some of these in context, so, so uh, metals that you're familiar with. Uh, so our, our face-centered cubic uh, ad uh, elements, uh, so aluminum, alumin, aluminum, uh, forms a, a face-centered cubic structure. Copper will form a face-centered cubic. Gold will form a face-centered cubic. And FCC is, is the densest packing that you can get of these elements. So uh, yeah, I think, I think it's a density around 76%. Um, our body-centered cubic elements, uh, the most 
common one is probably iron uh, is the one that that most people should be uh, that people should know about. Um, although iron gets very complicated, and there's uh, I don't know decades of research on different steels, so how you'd add different little particulates to iron and different heat treatments and temperature to make it steel and how that changes the structure. And I'm not going to talk about that at all. This is pure elemental iron. Um, what else is a good one? Uh, niobium, um, uh, which is probably less familiar to people. Um, hexagonal close packed. There's actually a few important ones uh, that form hexagonal close packed systems. Um, titanium is probably the biggest one. Uh, magnesium is kind of a new material or so so titanium for those of you who do mechanical design is a very popular element it normally comes as a titanium vanadium alloy um, but titanium is very relevant from an engineering standpoint uh, magnesium uh, is actually metallic uh, you probably know that it's very reactive uh, so magnesium alone is very seldom used, but magnesium alloys are becoming very popular nowadays, and there's a lot of research being done on those. Um, simple cubic, there's only one, uh, it's polonium, and it doesn't really matter because it doesn't get used very often, but it's kind of a fun fact, uh, because a simple cubic packing is a very non-optimal packing. Um, so. Each of these structures has, has kind of a very profound influence on how the pure materials deform, uh, and that itself is a whole big field of research that I'm not going to get into. Um, but so, so as these metals deform, uh, they form what are known as dislocations. So does that dislocation sound familiar? Is that a term people have heard of? OK. So as a quick reminder, uh, dislocation um, in a uh, continuum material uh, often it's, it's represented as this little upside down T um, what that actually is uh, is uh, if I have kind of this packing of atoms let's do it this way these are all supposed to be the same size they are not I apologize. Um, so if I have this packing of atoms, this little plus mark, or this half plus mark, T, upside down T, uh, represents this uh, extra line of, of atoms in here. So, um, yeah. Uh, so as, so metals, metals have metallic bonds between them, which are weak-ish. Uh, they're not quite the weakest bond, but they're not as strong as a covalent or an ionic bond. And so what that enables metals to do is to slip. So uh, these planes of atoms just kind of roll over each other. And uh, the mechanism by which they roll is, is a dislocation. So this dislocation will kind of transfer over, and you'll have dislocation lines kind of, kind of stepping over onto the next dislocation line. Um, at some point, if people are interested, I can actually show a molecular dynamics video. So people do simulations of the atomistic motion of these, which is pretty fun. Um, and I can pop that up later if people are interested. Um, what's important to keep in mind is this is actually something that forms in 3D. So uh, on, on a piece of paper, you would see it indicated as this little, as this little T mark. Um, what's actually happening in a material is you have what's known as a dislocation line. So that dislocation kind of propagates through a material. Oftentimes it's not actually a straight line. It kind of forms zigzags and loops and all kinds of crazy complex structures, which is what most of the research on dislocations involves. Um, so dislocation lines. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so this is how metals deform. But this is all for pure metals. So most of the engineering metals that you'll be working with, most of them that exist, are not pure single crystalline metals. What they instead form are grain structures. Grains. So you have 
a whole bunch of these metallic grains in a single material. Do, do, do. I'm going to draw some stuff. Uh, inside these grains, this is where your, your metal single crystal is. Um, but here, between those grains, you have what's known as a grain boundary. And oftentimes, it's these grain boundaries instead that kind of dictate the deformation of the materials. So, so it won't be, it'll be kind of a mix of plasticity in the individual grains and dislocations moving, uh, then dislocations getting stuck at grain boundaries, and the grain boundaries themselves then sliding and moving, depending on their structure. <coughs> now, um, I'm going to show you, let's go to, so I'm going to show you something that's called uh, an EBSD map, so electron backscatter diffraction. So most most of imaging of materials happen at, at the at the atomistic scale happens with electrons. So you shoot electrons at a material, they interact with those atoms. Um, a whole bunch of complicated stuff comes uh, happens. Uh, some of those electrons get absorbed, some get reflected, some get secondary emitted. Uh, a whole yeah. Uh, but one of those techniques is, is one of, some of those electrons are backscattered. So uh, electron backscatter diffraction, EBSD, is a technique where you can actually get a map of, of the grain structure. So each of these different colors represents a different orientation of the crystal structure. So um, that you don't necessarily need to know too much about, but this is kind of a nice way of, of visualizing what a, a crystalline structure in a metal looks like. So you see that this the scale bar down here, 35 microns, uh, so these are about 10 micron grains that are roughly even, um, and this would be kind of a, a typical annealed metal. Uh, they can get a lot more complicated depending on the processing conditions. So this is another EBSD map um, of kind of a maybe a cold worked metal where you get these long uh, fibril, fibrils, fibrils um, kind of very uneven distribution of, of orientations within the structure, and, and these two so, so this is kind of the crux of a lot of materials processing, is what, what does this structure buy me? If, I, if this is made of a steel or an aluminum or a titanium, uh, what, is this, what does this grain structure get me? And if I change it to this grain structure, how does that change the properties? Uh, does it make it better or worse? And how do I then anneal it or, or cold work it or, or do whatever to it to, to change that structure to, to something that'll make it stronger and tougher and more ductile. So that's some stuff <coughs> on metals. Let's jump to ceramics and then polymers. <coughs> so ceramics, I'm not going to dwell on too much because they're uh, more complicated, more in less interesting, more complicated, maybe less relevant for most people. Um, so, ceramics, uh, so these are mixes of two or more elements generally. Um, so here, they can form crystalline structures. Uh, crap. These are actually supposed to be different size balls this time. Uh, so, uh, two or more elements uh, can be can be crystalline or amorphous. So this something like table salt would form the sort of a crystal structure. The the crystal structures that form with ceramics are uh, infinitely more varied than the simple cubic, face center cubic, block cubic, and uh, hexagonal close pack that metals form. So you can get a whole bunch of different structures in this, and a lot of that changes their mechanical properties, changes their electrical properties, changes their thermal properties, and there's a whole lot there that, that I don't want to get into. Uh, but um, generally, these are uh, ionic or covalent bonds, uh, which are very 
strong. So what happens where, where metallic bonds are relatively soft and kind of allow those, those uh, crystals to move relative to each other, covalent and ionic bonds are very strong. So it resists <laughs> that motion up to the point of one of these starting to go, and then the whole thing will just kind of shatter. So because of the strength of the bonds, it doesn't allow for dislocations to move very easily. <coughs> Technically, they still can move, and if you heat up a ceramic, it'll kind of enable those dislocations to move. Because of the different sizes of the atoms, it also makes location motion weird in another way that I'm not going to talk about. Um, amorphous ones, let's draw kind of an amorphous structure really quick. Um, to the best of my ability to draw an amorphous structure. Uh, so the most common one is probably glass uh, is amorphous. So uh, because you're mixing more elements together, it's easier to get them to not form a crystal structure. So crystals are, are minimizing the energy of this material. When it's amorphous, it's <laughs> actually uh, less, it, it actually has more energy packed in because the, the atoms are kind of further apart and aren't able to kind of snap into that equilibrium configuration. Um, glasses are generally strong, amorphous materials are generally stronger, but even more brittle because there's absolutely no dislocation motion ability. Um, fun fact that you may or may not be aware of, you can actually form amorphous metals too. So metallic glasses um, are, are, you can, you can make, uh, and there's a whole field of research on that. Metallic glasses are also incredibly, incredibly strong, um, but they have, they're very, very brittle. So. Uh, they'll go to very, very high strengths and then just catastrophically rip apart uh, because, there, again, there's no dislocation mechanism when you have this amorphous structure. Um, but now it's going to dwell on that too much. Uh, jumping over to polymers. <coughs> okay, we're good on time. Um, so polymers are even more complicated. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that can go on with polymers. At the very simplest level, you have a polymer chain. So you have this chain uh, of what are basically MERS, and this is a polymer chain. So you have a, a single chain of these individual elements uh, I'll, I'll show you an example in a sec that kind of stitch together and form long, long chains. Um, that polymer can then connect with other chains uh, to create maybe like a branched, uh, branched, branched chain, uh, or it can tangle up with a whole bunch of polymers in all sorts of different directions uh, to make this sort of molecular spaghetti uh, that is a network. Yeah. So a polymer network. So um, to give you an example, instead of just drawing some spaghetti on the screen, um, so so a, a really simple polymer is polyethylene. So you have uh, ethylene. It's uh, Carbon, carbon, there's a couple hydrogens attached to the side. Hydrogen, hydrogen. So this is an ethylene molecule. So this would be your, your mer, if you will. Um, what happens You can uh, if you mix this together and heat treat it and combine it with other chemicals in the right way, uh, you can create a polyethylene, which is then a long chain of carbons carbon uh, with hydrogens attached on the sides. Shouldn't have drawn so many carbons because now I'm going to have to draw a lot of H's. H, 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 da, da, da. Okay, 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 okay. And then this kind of goes on. So polyethylene is, is one of the more common polymers that exist because it's so simple. Um, so, uh, in a normal polyethylene structure, if I just have kind of a, a standard, uh, polyethylene, this will have 
mechanical property wise, if it's oh, nah. Camera back. Nope, that didn't work at all. I'm gonna move my camera forward. There we go. That works. Um, so if it's a sort of standard polyethylene, uh, you can expect oh, you can expect uh, properties uh, a Young's modulus on the order uh, of maybe 0 0.2 GPA uh, and a yield strength on the order of maybe 10. MPA, so 10 megapascals, 0.2 GPA. So this is kind of a, a standard polymer. It's not super strong, it's not super stiff. It just kind of is, uh, and that's when you have this sort of amorphous network. Um, one of the more popular forms of polyethylene is something, something known as ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. So um, you ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. UHMWPE. Um, and so what happens in ultra high molecular weight polyethylene uh, is you get highly aligned polymer chains. So uh, one of the most uh, kind of interesting examples of UHMWPE is a, is a fiber known as Dyneema. So uh, Dyneema fibers which are these very long stretched out chains of, of basically crystalline polyethylene. So ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. So it's all kind of stacked up. And now this, this UHM WPE, these Dyneema fibers, um, will actually have, ah, I keep writing G, uh, Young's moduli on the order of 100 and 110 GPA uh, and yield strengths on the order of 3,500 uh, MPA. So you're getting almost a thousand fold increase in, in your mechanical properties, your stiffness and your strength, just by orienting these polymer chains correctly. Um, and what you, what's actually happening here is, is you're basically breaking these these carbon-carbon bonds when this thing fails. So you're by highly aligning these polyethylene chains, uh, you're actually getting the intrinsic strength of the, of the polymer chain. Whereas most polymers, if I, if I just kind of took this spaghetti mat of a, of a standard polymer, um, doesn't have the best properties because nothing is aligned. I mean, imagine, imagine if, I, if I took a pack of, of spaghetti, uncooked spaghetti, and I was to push on it. It's pretty stiff because <coughs> uh, all, all of the spaghetti will, is dry, but also is aligned with the direction that I'm pushing. If I then cook the spaghetti and I had a mat of spaghetti, uh, it would be kind of squishy. Um, and that's maybe an oversimplification, but it's kind of how you can imagine these different polymers. Um, the one important thing to consider now is when you have this sort of a network structure, uh, you have something known as uh, cross-linking. And so the amount, so whenever those polymer chains, whatever orientation they're in, touch, um, they can either kind of touch, uh, they can either couple with each other by van der Waals interaction, so just kind of a, a very light, almost electrostatic interaction, pulling it together, or they can actually bond uh, with a with what's known as a cross link. So cross being a cross between the polymer chains themselves, and depending on that crossing in density, uh, that can drastically affect the properties of your polymer. So if it's if it's very highly cross linked, it'll generally generally be stronger, but also more brittle. If it's very lowly lowly uh, weakly cross linked. That's the word I was looking for. It is very weakly cross-linked. Uh, it'll be less strong, but a lot more ductile and able to kind of stretch out. And those polymer chains will be able to reorient themselves better with the direction of applied load. Um, so polymers are, are very complicated, very interesting, but a little bit complicated. Um, so I have a exercise, an exercise that I want to try to pull up for you guys. <coughs> so let's jump over to pull everywhere. <coughs> 
incredibly anisotropic. Very good point. So, the yeah, yeah. I guess while while everyone is getting their phones out and getting ready, the yes, that is an incredibly important point. So, um, Dyneema now draw out these fibers is incredibly strong axially in the fiber direction, but transverse to the fiber, these are all actually just held together with Van der Waals forces. So there's there's almost there's very weak interactions holding them together. So if you shear one of these fibers, it has almost no strength. It it almost falls apart really. Um, and if you get a stack of these, if, uh, a Danima composite, which is normally how they're made, um, you can actually just peel the composite apart by your by hand because it's so weak. But in the direction of the fibers, you can't break it um, because th th just that fiber direction is incredibly strong. So yes. They're very, very an anisotropic. So this is also an important consideration when thinking about the structure of, uh, of these composites, or structure of the material, is, is how, how it affects the directions, not only in the direction you want, but also in the other directions. Thank you. OK. Uh, so pull everywhere stuff. So I have a question. Um, Hopefully everyone is ready with phones out. Uh, I want to see what you think about which which <coughs> grain. So if I take a metal with a small grain and a metal with a big grain, which one will be stronger? Kind of leaving that as a simple question. So there's a lot less disagreement than I would have thought, um, which is good. So in that case, uh, would someone like to explain why a smaller grain metal might be stronger than a larger grain metal? Uh, more grain boundaries impede dislocation motion. So the more grain boundaries you have, the less dislocation you get. Yes. So yeah. So did everyone hear that? Maybe at the back. Good. Would you like me to reach out? It. <laughs> go, go for it. There's more grain boundaries. They prevent dislocation motion. There we go. Everybody get that? Cool. Yeah. Okay. So if there was more disagreement, I was going to have you argue with your neighbors about it. Um, but since everyone is kind of on the same page. Came from MSC Law Sports, so. Oh, okay. So you're all familiar with this then, okay. ish. Uh, damn. I'm not really pretty shit, but. <laughs> All right, so yes, so the I uh, so <coughs> I'm glad uh, that you're all kind of on the same page there. Uh, the idea here uh, is is known as the Hall Pet, uh, which does that word ring a bell or does that phrase ring a bell? No. Okay, so uh, the mechanistic name for for having smaller grain boundaries be stronger is known as the Hall Petch effect. Hall Petch uh, strengthening, which basically says um, exactly that. If if I have, I'm now going to make uh, hexagonal grains just because they're easier to draw. Um, oh, if I can even draw hexagonal grains. <coughs> um, so. Like I had said before, uh, when you have dislocations moving through a crystal, if I were to, to apply some shear force tau to the system, uh, in order to deform that grain, that dislocation needs to move through your material. And if you have a grain boundary, that impedes the motion. So this dislocation needs to actually jump across a grain boundary um, to, to move. And if I have then a smaller crystal, uh, da, da, da. Not that, something like this. Um, it's harder than, there's more of these, there's a higher density of grain boundaries. So, high, higher 
grain boundary density. So it means they have to jump past these grain boundaries more often. Um, there's a strengthening law that kind of gives, as a proportionality, your, your sigma yield strength uh, is equal to your strength plus some constant uh, over the square root of your diameter, of your grain size, where this is your grain size. So as, as I make these things smaller, so I have grain size uh, D on one axis and my my yield strength on the other axis. Um, it kind of starts over here and then there's actually there's actually a tipping point where this will actually start to drop back down. So there's something called an inverse hop hedge effect. Does anyone so so this is uh, this point over here would be large grains, small grains, and these would be incredibly fine grains. Does anybody have any idea why there might why there might be that sort of an inverse <coughs> inverse effect? Why it might start to drop off? Uh, sort of. That's a that's the a, a right a good idea. But uh, what what's actually happening at a grain boundary? Yeah. Sort of. So, so I'll, I guess I'll just so so grain boundaries are are weird structures. Um, so it, it's a discontinuity in the crystal, um, and it's there's a whole bunch of different ways to think about them and model them. But basically, when you when you have uh, two crystals oriented in a certain direction and they meet at that grain boundary, there's going to be some sort of a some sort of an interface region where they don't line up perfectly. And so you can actually sometimes model that as a very high uh, packing of dislocations at that interface um, atomistically, but it also kind of depends on the orientation of the crystals and how disordered they are uh, and what angle they meet at. And so grain boundaries themselves are, are also an incredibly complicated topic of research. So they're, they're not, you are on the right track with, uh, it's not exactly grain boundary or dislocation sliding at the grain boundaries, but this tipping point will start to happen actually at around 10 nanometers. So that, that ish, um, so that magic tipping point where you get this weakening effect. And what happens is your grain boundary actually becomes a dominant volume fraction of your material. So the grain, if you think about the crystal packing, the crystal packing is dense. In the grain boundary, there's a low volume fraction of material because it can't pack in a perfect crystal. And so uh, it, the grain boundary itself can slide easily. It's not necessarily dislocations in the grain boundary, um, but the grain boundary itself is weak. So the grain boundary sort of it doesn't necessarily fracture, but it can slip and slide. And it also depends on the angle that the crystals meet at. Um, but around that 10 nanometer mark, you're getting to the point where your grains, the grain boundary is actually a considerable fraction of, of the, or considerably size relative to the grain itself. So you actually get what's known as an inverse hall patch effect in that size range. Cool. So um, there's a fun example paper um, on that I'll give you really quick on cold rolled treated copper. So uh, an example on Cold rolled uh, heat treated copper, and so um, <coughs> what happens in a cold rolling process? 
is you take, oh, damn it, um, is you take a bulk material, so you kind of take a big block of something uh, with relatively large grains. Uh, let's draw some grain boundaries in here. Some stuff. Uh, da, da, da. Here's some of these. Um, and you shrink it down in size. Normally using these big old rollers. And that then down. Um, and you do that again, and you shrink it down even further. To the point where it's very, very small. So as you start to, to do this cold rolling process, these grains go from pretty large size grains, um, or can go from fairly large size grains, uh, to getting broken up, uh, squeezed a little bit in the direction of the sliding, but also made to be smaller. Let's do some of this. Some of that. Da, da, da. And then again, this gets broken down to be very, very tiny. So eventually these form very, very small <coughs> grains. So, uh, in that process, what happens mechanically, and there's a paper on this that, I, that I'll link on the, on the website, um, you start off with, let's say, something 80, my strain as a percent, uh, and my strength as like an MPA, uh, 600, 1, 2, These are very unevenly distributed, I apologize. Um, so you start off with something, um, that may be fairly ductile. This should be more smooth. Ignore some of this. Ah, again, this is the problem is I can't erase with a pen. Maybe I should use pencil. Um, but so you start off with something that's relatively weak. So this is large grains um, with something on a on the order of maybe 40 uh, what was it 60 oh. 60 MPA for a copper um, and when you cold roll it down to say 95 percent <coughs> This is cold rolled to, or by, let's say, by 95%. All of a sudden now my, my yield strength can be on the order of 430 MPA. So I can get a pretty drastic change in the properties um, by, by doing this cooling process. And so, this is why, again, when, when you say I have something that's made of copper or made of steel, um, what's incredibly important isn't, isn't just the material that it's made out of, but how it's processed and how it's been treated afterward. Um, so two metals that are the exact same metal started off from the same ingot, the same block of original material. Uh, one was cold rolled, one was annealed, one was whatever, uh, can, be, can be drastically different. Um, so the question then is, so now we can see that our, uh, our original material was, was fairly ductile. Copper is, is generally able to deform quite a bit uh, with these large grains uh, to something that was very, very strong, but not very ductile. So which, which uh, in terms of engineering materials is not optimal. So how, how might we be able to kind of overcome this problem? How can I make something that's still strong, but retains its ductility? Heat treat. Ah, okay. Yes, heat treating. So uh, there was a paper. This this data comes out of a paper. Uh, high tensile ductility 
in nano structured metal uh, by Guy Y Wong. Uh, it's all uh, published. Oh, published in Nature in 2002. So, uh, sorry. <coughs> so now, uh, what they did was they, they cold rolled these metals uh, and heat treated this. So, heat treat at, uh, I think it was 200 C for three minutes. So not a very long amount of time. And what happened uh, was by annealing it for just a little bit of time, for, for a shorter amount of time, you maintain some of the small grains, and then you're also able to, to coarsen some of these grains. So uh, you get something that's kind of in the middle, has some large, some small grains in there. Um, so you, you maintain some of that grain boundary strengthening, but you also maintain some of the ductility uh, because of your larger structure. And what they were able to show was something that had a slightly lower yield strength. Um, this is cold works uh, plus annealed. And the yield strength was around 330 MPA. So here, again, the processing can be incredibly important to the end resulting properties. Uh, so with that, um, oh, damn. Let's see. I don't know if you guys want to stick around for another, or maybe I'll just show it tomorrow. Yeah, I can show it tomorrow. <laughs> so. Um, Tomorrow I'll, I'll talk really briefly about how material properties break down and then we'll actually get into some of the mechanics. <laughs>